Hello everyone. Welcome to the continuation of the diseases of periodontium. In the last class, we spoke about gingivitis, necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis and desquamative gingivitis. In today's class, we will continue talking about the various gingival diseases which show gingival enlargement and the etiology, pathogenesis, types of periodontal diseases. Let's look at gingival enlargement. The most common cause of gingival enlargement is an inflammatory gingival enlargement, which is caused due to plaque accumulation, leading to excessive amount of inflammatory cell infiltrate, edema, leading to gingival enlargement. This is usually associated with bleeding on probing and spontaneous bleeding. Whereas the other etiologies could be drug induced, enlargement associated with systemic factors, idiopathic gingival enlargement, neoplastic changes in the gingiva and also false enlargement. As discussed, inflammation induced gingival enlargement is main cause of enlargement in the gingiva. As you can see in the picture here, you can make out that the margins of the gingiva are swollen there is loss of stippling and the gingiva looks shiny. Most of the time there will be spontaneous bleeding or bleeding on probing. It is invariably associated with poor oral hygiene. Hence the main treatment would be to prescribe oral hygiene practices and relieve the symptoms. There are many medications which causes growth of the fibroblasts leading to gingival enlargement. These groups of drugs mainly include the anti-epileptic or the anti-convulsant drugs like dilantin sodium, immunosuppressants like cyclosporine and calcium channel blockers like nifedipine, nitrendipine etc. The characteristic of drug induced gingival enlargement is the characteristic accentuation of the stippling. Gingival surfaces they show a pebbled appearance most of the time there is a nodular enlargement of the gingiva that is seen the proliferation is usually painless and is fleshy with proliferation of the fibrous tissue the treatment would be as simple as stopping the medication but unfortunately the enlarged gingiva doesn't come back to normal Unfortunately, the enlarged gingiva does not come back to normal. Thus, a surgical excision for aesthetic and functional adaptation would be required. There are a lot of systemic conditions where you will see gingival enlargement. One of the most common ones is pregnancy associated gingivitis. A lobular hemangioma is a variant of pyogenic granuloma. As you can see in this picture, you can see large blood vessels which are dilated and engorged. This is seen to be associated with the hormonal changes that are associated with pregnancy. It is also called as pregnancy epulis. Nutritional deficiencies like vitamin C deficiency also known as scurvy is known to cause gingival enlargement. Allergic responses to the gingiva due to recent change in the toothpaste, dietary changes, chewing gums etc. leads to excessive accumulation of plasma cells. This type of gingival enlargement is called as plasma cell gingivitis. This is seen in the marginal gingiva usually and is associated with hyperplastic gingiva and chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate. Leukemia this is the most common neoplastic enlargement that you can see in a gingiva. The usual description is that of a boggy gingiva. The gingiva is showing a shiny bluish red color because of the congestion of the blood vessels filled with immature lymphocytes. It is soft, edematous, easily compressible and will be associated with poor oral hygiene. It can be localized or generalized. In this case, you can see a generalized gingival enlargement. Histologically, you can see that the whole of the gingival tissue is accumulated with immature leukemic cells. These leukocytes will 
cause congestion leading to the bluish discoloration. Another reason for gingival enlargement is the unknown cause. It's also called as elephantiasis gingivae or fibromatosis gingivae. On the contrary to the drug induced gingiva enlargement, you will see a shiny surface with loss of stippling. The gingiva will look normal in color and the gingival enlargement will be so much that the tooth may be impeded to erupt. Let's move on to the periodontal diseases. If the gingival disease is not treated, it leads to inflammation progressing to the periodontal tissues leading to periodontitis. Periodontitis can be acute or chronic. It can be localized or generalized. It can be aggressive periodontitis wherein the destruction is quite rapid. It can be localized, generalized or can be associated with hormones induced in the prepubertal phase. Periodontitis can also be a systemic manifestation. Hematological diseases, genetic diseases can lead to periodontitis. We will be talking about some syndromes in the end of the lecture. Necrotizing periodontal diseases like a progression of the necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis is usually seen in HIV infected individuals. Abscess of the gingiva, abscess of the periodontal tissue, pericoronal abscess fall under the category of periodontal diseases. You can also have an endodontic periodontic lesions. These are progression of the pulpal disease around the tooth to involve the periodontal tissue. Let's have a look at the stages of the periodontal disease. In the first figure, you can make out that the gingiva is nicely attached to the cementoenamel junction. Due to accumulation of plaque, you may have extra inflammation. This inflammation may progress into the periodontal tissue. And this leads to detachment of the soft tissue to the tooth. The progression of this leads to the loss of the periodontal ligament attachment. The attachment epithelium recedes and the pocket gets deeper into the tooth structure. Finally, the pocket may go down deeper leading to loss of the bone tissue also. So the periodontal disease not only involves the loss of the attachment but also involves the loss of the periodontal ligament and the bone. Periodontitis is defined as an inflammatory disease of the supporting tissues of the tooth caused by specific microorganisms or a group of specific microorganisms. This results in progressive destruction of the periodontal ligament and alveolar bone with pocket formation, clinically seen as recession or both. Let's have a look at periodontitis. Periodontitis is usually preceded by gingivitis. And there are a lot of microbes involved. One of the most common bacteria involved is Actinobacillus actinomycetum comitans, which is recently known as Aggregatibacter actinomycetum comitans. The other bacteria involved are Bacteroids forsythes, Porphyromonas gingivalis, Privotella intermedia. There are other clinical features associated along with gingivitis. That is loss of attachment which can be seen clinically by probing. The pocket formation may lead to abscess and may cause problem in bone loss and loosening of the teeth. The chronic periodontitis is also known as periodontoclasia or pyoria. Usually seen in adults who have poor oral hygiene. May be occasionally seen in children due to bad oral hygiene and severe malocclusion. There is marginal gingivitis which leads to a destructive periodontal tissue and loosening of the teeth. Here in the clinical appearance you can make out the loss of the attachment and recession which is one of the most common clinical features. The recession is seen in the mandibular anteriors very clearly. On a radiograph you can make out loss of bone in the alveolar crystal region. This tooth will lose the attachment and leads to mobility of the particular tooth. Histologically you can make out loss of the bone in that region 
and the attachment will recede from that of the cemento enamel junction. If the pocket is seen above the crest of the bone, it's called as the supraboni pocket. If the pocket extends below the level of the alveolar crest, it is called as the infraboni pocket. There is dense inflammatory cell infiltrate seen at the call region in this particular photograph. The bone surface is lined by osteoclasts present in the Hauschip's lacunae, which leads to bone resorption. The treatment involves debridement, curettage, plaque control. The plaque control has to be vigorously monitored by the individual. Establishment of the fibrous connection with the tooth is possible and requires surgical intervention. Bone regeneration techniques like guided tissue regeneration can be employed in case of deep infrabony pockets. Another variant of periodontitis is called as the aggressive periodontitis. This is a rapidly progressing type of periodontitis. And surprisingly, the patient does not have large amounts of plaque and calculus. They have thought about a familial origin of this particular disease. And the predominant etiology is the aggregative actor actinomycetum comitans. The characteristic of an aggressive periodontitis is the typical anterior and posterior C-shaped bone loss. You will see bone loss in the region of the 6 and bone loss in the region of the 1. People have theorized that this is mainly because 6, the first molar, 1's, the central incisors, are the first teeth to erupt. Hence, they are present the longest in the oral cavity leading to the first evidence of bone loss seen in these two. There is a typical C-shaped bone loss around the tooth in these molars and incisors. An aggressive periodontitis is called generalized when at least three teeth other than the molars and the incisors are involved. Presence of large accumulation of plaque and calculus and gingival inflammation may or may not be there but usually seen after a particular stage and patients are generally above the age of 30. Histopathologically, it is similar to the chronic periodontitis where we see bone loss and excessive inflammation. The main stage management system here is plaque control with antibiotic coverage and a periodic follow-up is a must. Necrotizing ulcerative periodontitis is generally seen in younger patients. There are systemic symptoms seen in these similar to that of necrotizing ulcerative gingivitis. You have fever, malice, lymphadenopathy associated with these. These are commonly associated with HIV positive individuals where the immunosuppression is already existent. Another disease of the periodontium is the lateral periodontal abscess. As you can see here, there is a small swelling which may break up and form a fistula. This is also called as a gum boil or parulis. It is generally seen 5 to 8 mm deeper to that of the gingival margin. Here is another example of parulis and on an IOPA you can make out bone loss in that region. Histopathologically, you can see destruction of the periodontal ligament attachment and necrosis in that particular region of abscess formation. The pocket is pretty deep and the probe will go deeper to the site of the abscess. As it is an abscess, drainage is the first stage of treatment. Give antibiotic coverage, debride the area and think about tissue regeneration in that particular region. There is a syndrome called as Papillon Lefebvre syndrome named after the individuals who identified it in 1924. It is an autosomal recessive disorder and has dermal and oral findings. Palma plantar keratosis, hyperhidrosis that is increasing sweating, dirty colored bronzing of skin along with aggressive periodontitis are the four main features of Papillon Lefebvre syndrome. Here is an example. There is very early loss of teeth in a child, 
the bronzing of the skin because of palmar plantar keratosis and hyperhidrosis excessive sweating in the palms a widespread bone destruction is seen there is severe bone loss leading to the apical region of the tooth only being attached there is complete bone loss in this molar here so these are to be kept in mind as a syndrome in case of periodontitis that completes the chapter on diseases of periodontium thank you